The Peter Schiff Show. When I recorded my podcast on Friday, just looking at the technical action in the dollar, and I was getting nervous that maybe we could have been setting ourselves up for some kind of holiday surprise, a big drop uh, over the three-day weekend that could have led to some real fireworks uh, on Tuesday. And, you know, when the market started, everybody ignored the new low that the dollar made over the weekend. And they were buying stocks with both hands out of the gate. The Dow gapped up and it kept going up. I think it opened up almost 200 points and then was up 280 points, maybe in the first half hour of trading. We went above 26,000. It was just 12 days ago. We were at 25,000. That was the fastest move of 1,000 points in the history of the Dow. Now, of course, you know, a thousand points doesn't mean as much when you're going from twenty five thousand to twenty six thousand as when we went from one thousand to two thousand or even from ten thousand or eleven thousand. But still, it was very quick. And in fact, if you look at the trading days, it was just six days because one of those days was Martin Luther King Day and we didn't trade. So in six trading days, the Dow rallied a thousand points. But you know what? It couldn't hold the gain. The Dow actually sold off at its lows of the day. We were down 100. So almost a 400-point swing. We closed negative on the day, uh, not very much, but the Dow was actually the best-performing index. It was only down about 10 points. Percentage-wise, it was barely down. But the NASDAQ was down a half a percent, and the S&P 500 was down uh, 0.35%. So we'll see if we get some follow-through tomorrow to this potential reversal. I mean, it wasn't a massive reversal in that we didn't close way down, but we did close down. We did make new highs and we closed lower. So we'll see. Meanwhile, the dollar did close out on another new low. We didn't necessarily take out the overnight lows from Martin Luther King Day when we were closed, but we we closed very near the lows. The dollar index went off at 90.45, I think the low over the holiday weekend was 90.28. But the dollar had started to get back some of those losses earlier this morning, and it surrendered them by the end of the day. But the technicals are just looking worse and worse for the dollar. This so far has not bothered the stock market crowd because all they can see are positives. But if everything were positive, the dollar would be going up. It would not be going down. And people still don't understand what this means, what this implies, what it's going to do to interest rates, what it's going to do to inflation, consumer prices, and the box that puts the Fed in, and how the Fed is damned if it does and damned if it doesn't. Because if it raises rates to put a floor beneath the dollar and a lid on inflation, then everything collapses. We have a worse financial crisis than 2008. Right? The market implodes or the Fed doesn't do that because it's afraid of that. And we get something worse. We get a currency crisis. We get a complete dollar implosion. We get maybe hyperinflation. So we have probably never been this close to something this bad. And remember, think back to the days leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. Other than me, was anybody worried about anything? Was anybody warning about anything? No, it was Goldilocks. Right, Everything was perfect. Right. That's it's even better now. See, again, back then they at least let me on television to give the other side. Now they think, what's the point? Everything is so great. We don't even want anybody uh, to be warning about the possibility of a problem because there is no possibility because there are no problems. Everything is perfect. Why? What has happened since Trump has been elected? Right. The market's up 40 percent since we elected Donald Trump. What has he done? Nothing. Has government been reduced? No. Have we, sh- we haven't gotten rid of any agencies. We haven't gotten rid of any departments. All we did is cut taxes, and the tax cuts have barely even gotten to effect yet. And how did we finance the tax cuts? By running up the deficit. But you know what? We did get a reminder uh, from, of all places, China, our largest uh, creditor, They have a rating agency there, which is like, you know, we have Standard & Poor's and Moody's. And so they've got their own uh, rating agencies over there. And this agency, Dangong Global, downgraded U.S. uh, government debt. I don't know, triple B, I forget where it is, but it's some low level. I mean, we're below 
Russia. We're, be- we're below some countries in Africa even. We're, 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 we're the same as Colombia as far as uh, this um, rating agency in China. But they're right. I mean, our debt is junk. It, it's not that we are going to default. I mean, I don't think we have the integrity to default. We're going to print. You know, when you are rating the bonds of a country that is borrowing in its own currency, you're not really rating the bonds. You're rating the currency because we never have to default on our debt. We just run the printing presses. But that's worse than default because you're repaying your creditors in money where the the value has defaulted. And we should be worried because China is our biggest lender. And all this makes sense, right? Rumors that China is going to stop buying treasuries. Now you have a downgrade out of China. You know, by the way, the Bundesbank finally announced that they were now going to include Chinese yuan in their currency reserves at the expense of what? Obviously, the dollar. They have to sell off the dollar to make room for the yuan. Now, the, the ECB had already made this announcement some time ago, but now you have the Bundesbank with its own reserves uh, buying uh, yuan for dollars. So all this makes sense. And again, I've said this. If the Treasury, the Federal Reserve has already said, whether it's bluffing or not, but the the Federal Reserve says we're not buying any more treasuries, right? That's what the the tapering or the shrinkage is all about. We're not going to buy any more treasuries. We're going to let our balance sheet run down. So if the Federal Reserve doesn't want to buy treasuries, why should anybody else? You know, and of course, if China's not buying, I mean, why should they buy them? If they keep downgrading the debt, I mean, who wants to invest in junk bonds that have yields that are at historic lows? So this should be weighing on Wall Street. After all, why is the market so high? Or how could you possibly justify these crazy valuations? And that's based on interest rates being really low. Well, they may not be low for long. Rates could spike up very quickly. We can have a big drop in the bond market and then look out. But no, nobody was worried about this, but somebody sold into this rally. Right? This rally couldn't hold, and we ended up being lower on the day. So we'll see if people start to question this narrative, this rosy scenario. Nothing could go wrong. Believe me, lots of things could go wrong, and probably all of them will. That was how I titled uh, my last podcast, just you know, basically a corollary to Murphy's Law. Instead of anything that can go wrong will go wrong. I wrote everything that can go wrong will go wrong. That's how bad this is. Yet everybody is completely oblivious to these risks. Now, the price of gold was up today, but not very much. You know, we're still below uh, uh, 1350. And so I think as long as we're below that, there are some people that are thinking this is the top. But I think once we clear above that, as I've been saying, I think we can have a monster move up once we take out that overhead resistance and maybe run some of those stops up there between 1350 and 1400. The Treasury market could come under a lot more pressure. Uh, Oil prices were actually down a little bit today, but that trend, that upward trend in oil prices should be disturbing because it's not just low interest rates that have been fueling this bubble. It's cheap gas. It's the fact that Americans have, you know, haven't had to spend as much money to buy gas. You know, I was looking at adjustable rate mortgages and still about 10 percent of the mortgages uh, are adjustable rate, even with rates this low. And um, and then we have a lot of home equity lines and, and those are all adjustable rate. I think there's a couple of trillion if you look at adjustable rate mortgages and home equity lines. So there are a lot of people uh, that are going to get crushed if interest rates go up and now they have to spend more. And by the way, they can't even deduct the interest payments at all on the home equity loans. So it's a it's a it's a double whammy. So you got a lot of people that are going to be affected. But a lot of these banks right that have written all these long-term loans at low coupons. If interest rates spike up, the short rates spike up because the dollar is collapsing, all this positive cash flow for these banks turns into negative cash flow because they're stuck. They already lent long, and now they have to pay the Fed higher rates of interest. That is the reason that the Fed will be so reluctant to raise rates because they don't want to bankrupt all the too-big-to-fail banks that they bailed out because now they're all a lot bigger because we didn't let them fail. But if we don't let them fail, if we keep interest rates artificially low so they don't fail, then we turn the dollar into monopoly money. And again, all this stuff is going to be playing out. And this is what I have been uh, preparing people for. This is what I have been uh, warning people about. Yes, I've been warning about it for a long time because it's a big problem. And it's been evolving 
over a long period of time. But in the scheme of things, this is not a long time. When people look back at the history books, whether the dollar crisis happened in 2010 or 2020, it's not going to matter. It's the same era. It's the same time period. And the same investors are going to be living through it. Now, it's not just the bubble on Wall Street that could be popping, but the crypto bubble. Now, I've been talking about this, but the currencies, the cryptocurrencies are getting clobbered today. I mean, Bitcoin, I don't know if it's leading the way. I mean, because there are certainly other currencies that are down more. But as I am recording this, Bitcoin is down 23% on the day. It's about 10,400. This is the low of the day so far. Now, I have no idea if it'll still be above 10,000 by the time anybody is listening to uh, this, uh, this podcast. But it's just a month ago, a month ago that Bitcoin hit 20,000 or you know, just about 20,000. So we're down about 50%. And, you know, Bitcoin down 23% of the day. Look at all these other, look at the top 100 cryptocurrencies. You'll find a lot of these currencies down 30, 40% today, today alone. Now, you know, a lot of people I know in the Bitcoin community, hey, this is no big deal for them, right? Uh, the people that have been in this thing for a long time, they don't care, right? These are the holders, right? They're never going to sell. Right. Because you're a wimp if you sell. You're a loser if you sell. Right. That's part of the cult. Right. They even they even spell hold H-O-D-L. Right. They some guy, I guess some guy sent an email to somebody or posted on a chat room and, you know, he he, he got a typo. But now that's like the, the rallying cry of the cult of Bitcoin is that you never sell no matter what. And of course, the people who are selling love this. Right. Because the only people who are going to make money are the people who sell the people who are just holding you know, are going to lose whatever they spent to buy, right? But the people who want to get out have to convince a lot of other people not to get out because otherwise they can't. But you've got this whole crowd of people that never sells. And of course, that helped the, the price run up because you didn't have sellers. Well, now you don't have buyers. It seems like they're running out of buyers, right? All the hype. And I talked about this at the time that we were hitting 20,000. We had all the earmarks of a, a, a blow off top. Right. All the coverage, all the media. I mean, everybody was going crazy over Bitcoin. You couldn't do anything without the topic coming up. I mean, it was everywhere. I've been invited now. I mean, I'm not invited to talk about Bitcoin on uh, on CNBC or Fox or Bloomberg. But these conferences, I just, you know, I turned down an invitation. I don't have time to go to Dubai uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. They want me to speak, but I might accept an invitation to speak at a Bitcoin conference in March. In, in Hong Kong, but I've gotten a few others. I mean, I'm turning them down mostly because I'm too busy. But th those are the only people that want to see me speak right now is people who are having cryptocurrency conferences. They're everywhere. They're popping up all over the world, right? People are getting together on cryptos. And, and so to me, it seemed like all the, the trappings, right, of, of the top. In fact, I put on my Facebook page, I came across this YouTube video that got over half a million views. I mean, I never get half a million views when I put up a YouTube video. And this is a young girl, probably in her early 20s. And the picture, right, the thumbnail that you look at, it's a picture of this young girl smiling. And behind her bag is head is bags of money, dollar bills, and little coins. You know, I guess bitcoins that look like they're made of gold. I don't know. But it's all this money around her. And it says, I'm rich, bitch. And it's not the bitch. In the bitch, it's B-I-S-H. And the S is a dollar sign. And it's Bitcoin for beginners. And then below that, it says how I got rich off Bitcoin cryptocurrency for beginners. Right. And she's got over half a million people that are watching her. So this is the you know, this is what you get at these market tops. Right. So now you've had Bitcoin has been cut in half over the last uh, month. Now, the guys that got in a long time ago. OK, no big deal. But think about the mentality now of people who watch that video, how to get rich bitch, you know, and who bought Bitcoin at 18,000, 19,000, 17,000. Now it's, they've lost 30, 40% of their money. How do you think they feel? I mean, they're not diehard libertarians. They don't even really know what a fiat currency is. All they know is they have less of it and they didn't plan on that. And if this correction gets bigger, we break through 10,000. Remember, I've been talking about this head and shoulders top. Well, we're below the neckline right now. And now, you know, 10,300 as I'm recording here. If we close below 10,000, we can go to 5,000 very quickly. Now, 5,000 is still high if you bought it 500 or 100 or even 1,000. 
But if you bought at 15,000, you know, you're not liking it when it's at 5,000. And, you know, a month ago, all the stories were about all the people getting rich off of Bitcoin. Well, you know what's going to change? Now we're going to have a bunch of stories about people losing their shirts on Bitcoin. And so now the narrative is going to be a lot different. It's not like people are going to be wanting to buy it when they're hearing all these horror stories about how much money people have lost, right? You have a brand problem. You have a target. Now, we had the same thing when Bitcoin initially went up from, you know, under 100 to 1,000 very quickly and got a lot of press. And then people bought it and then it dropped back down to 200, right? And so people were burned and it took a few years to, to get a new crop of buyers. But this time around, this is so enormous. I mean, I would bet right now that more people own Bitcoin at a loss than at a gain, right? That the number of people who own Bitcoins that are down exceeds the number of people who are up. Because the problem is the people who are up, this is a small number of people, right? You have highly concentrated positions. But over the last couple of months, you had lots of people, record numbers of people buying tiny positions in Bitcoin. So from a raw number perspective, you've got more people who have lost money in Bitcoin on paper than who have made it. So that's not going to be good branding or good marketing. You have all these people out there telling all their friends how much money they lost. And now, of course, other people who are thinking about buying cryptocurrencies who didn't are like, cool, I'm glad I didn't do that. I'm glad I didn't put my money in Bitcoin at 18,000. Now it's at 10,000. So this whole narrative is going to stop. Now, I don't believe that we've had enough pain yet to cause any of the long-term believers to get out. No, we're going to have to go a lot lower before that happens. Because I said, I have had people who have sent me money that they have cashed out of Bitcoin. But it's a small number. Most of the people out there haven't cashed out anything. You know, they, they're afraid to cash out. They're too greedy. It's the fear of missing out, right? FOMO. Nobody wants to be the guy that sold Bitcoin at 20000 when it's at 100000 So you end up holding it when it's at zero. So this is where we are now. We'll see. I, I think that there's a good chance, and I was saying it back then, that we've seen the highs. Because I don't know that we can recover from another 90% decline. If Bitcoin goes from 20000 to 2000 or 1000 I don't know that it could do it again. It's just gonna be, There's going to be too many people who own too many Bitcoins at much higher prices who don't have the courage or the conviction, right? They don't think this is a game changer. They don't have any problems with central banks. They didn't buy Bitcoin because it was a revolution. They bought it because they thought they could make money, right? They, they didn't want to get rid of dollars. They just wanted more of them. And they saw Bitcoin as a way to do it, right? It was a means to an end. There are some people that don't see it that way. They think they're going to bring about the change of the world, right? That this is going to be the thing that takes the power away from the central banks. And, and it's not. I mean, we can have money that central banks don't create. It already exists. It's gold. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. All we have to do is modernize it. And you could do that with blockchain technology or the Internet. You don't even need a blockchain. We can use gold now in a way that's very efficient uh, that we couldn't in the past. Right? I've been talking about that a lot on gold money, how gold money enables uh, us to use gold as a medium of exchange. See, gold could be a medium of exchange. Gold has the stability to be a medium of exchange. You can price products in gold. You can borrow money in gold. You can buy insurance products priced in gold. You can make long-term plans in gold. Gold has historic relationships to other products, to oil, to silver, to copper, uh, to wheat. You have a way of knowing whether something is cheap or expensive if it's priced in gold. None of that is true when it comes to a cryptocurrency. There is no history of a value of relationships. It's much too volatile to ever be a currency. That's what you know people were pointing out to today. And it has no store of value. There is no value to store. So that is not going to take down the central banks. I, I warned, and I, I think I'm going to be proven right on this, that the best thing for the central banks is going to be these cryptocurrencies. Because cryptocurrencies are going to be so bad, they're going to make fiat paper currencies look good. Right? And they're going to help the government because what are they going to do? Right? They're going to say, oh, you lost all this money because you trust the free market. You trusted the private sector. You need to put your trust in government. You know, We need more regulations. We need more government. So the people who got all invested in, in cryptocurrencies, 
Cryptocurrencies are going to achieve the opposite of what everybody hoped. Instead of taking power away from government, they're going to give more power to government. Right? Ultimately, it's gold that can take government down because gold is real money and gold can do what all these fiat currencies can't. Unfortunately, these cryptocurrencies can't do it. And I think we're in the process of proving that now. I mean, now, we're, we now, now we've got to 10,200, so we're slowly moving down. I mean, I would expect some buying to come in around 10,000, right? Some of these punters or, you know, some of the big holders, I think, try to manipulate this market. I think there are some, some people in there, the whales, that take profits on the way up so that they can have a bunch of dry powder on the way down to try to, you know, stop the market from falling. And so we'll see if they're there. But one of these days, some of these whales are going to say, you know what? I'll let the other whales do the buying. I'm done, right? I'm getting out, right? Because at some point, it's not the fear of missing out. It's the fear of loss, right? Because there are a lot of people that have huge fortunes tied up in Bitcoin. And yeah, they wanted to get the fortune. They wanted the fortune to be a lot bigger. And so they were greedy. But if they, all of a sudden they're afraid of losing the fortune they got left, they may want to get out, right? It's, you know, it's kind of like a prisoner dilemma kind of situation. Maybe you have a gentleman's agreement among a number, number of people, or not prisoner's dilemma. Maybe it's you know, just like a, a cartel where everybody agrees to hold on and let's manipulate the market and keep it propped up. Uh, but then someone decides, hey, I'm getting out, right? You know, and the whole thing falls apart, just like any kind of cartel, because people then decide to act in their own best interest. Not they don't think about the group. They think about themselves and they want to, you know, they, they want to ring the cash register. So we could be close to a point like that. Now, the one thing that we haven't seen happen, though, is a big move up in gold. And I've been saying that it could be a breakout in the price of gold that causes a collapse in the cryptocurrencies. But it also could be the reverse. It could be the collapse of cryptocurrencies that causes an explosion in the price of gold because cryptocurrencies have been stealing gold's thunder for the last couple of years. Well, maybe gold is going to get some of that thunder back because gold is up this year, right? As the U.S. stock market is starting to fall, if it keeps falling, the dollar is falling, gold is rising. Cryptocurrencies are not. Cryptocurrencies are falling. So fool's gold is going down and real gold is going up. So a big collapse in cryptocurrencies with a rise in the price of gold really highlights the difference. And now we can start to see a move because gold is really breaking out now in terms of cryptocurrencies. Gold had been in a major downtrend in terms of Bitcoin. Not anymore. It's broken out of that downtrend. And so this could cause people who own Bitcoin to want to buy gold and also people who are thinking about buying cryptocurrencies to buy gold instead or people that were saying, oh, why should I buy gold? Because, you know, there's cryptocurrencies. Well, hey, yeah, you see how unreliable these cryptocurrencies are. They could collapse at any minute. And a lot of people in cryptocurrencies might want to hedge the risk that they have in cryptocurrencies by buying gold, right? Because people thought, oh, these, you know, they're correlated. They trade the same. No, they don't. If there's any correlation, it's inverse. If gold's going up, cryptos could be going down. That's that that's a more realistic correlation because Bitcoin now especially is trying to compete with gold. It's not trying to compete with other currencies because they've acknowledged that it can't function as a currency. So then what good is it? Well, it's digital gold. Well, if it can collapse 25 percent in one day, I mean, how is that a safe haven? How is that a store of value? Right. There's no safety there at all. It's the riskiest asset you could buy. Bitcoins are riskier than any stock that you could own. Right. So are all these cryptocurrencies. So a risk asset or safe haven can't be risky. Right. Gold is safety. Right. Gold is liquidity. These these currencies are, are, are highly speculative assets. And so they can't be the hedge. You need to hedge it. If you own these currencies, you need to find a hedge for them. They're not the hedge. So this whole narrative is, is being turned upside down. And so we'll see, you know, and if you're listening to this podcast, I mean, look, do you sell your Bitcoin now? See, here's the dilemma you're in, right? If you didn't sell any at 20000 are you going to sell at 10000 I would still say yes, even though it could bounce back from here. You don't have to sell everything, but you don't want to go down with the ship and sell nothing because then you never sell. Oh, shoot, I could have sold at 20000 so I'm not going to sell at 10000 Well, then it goes to 5000 Well, I can't sell at 5000 because I didn't sell at 10000 right? You get yourself trapped. And then you also have this value trap where, well, I can't sell at 10000 because that's half off. I mean, it used to be 20000 This is a bargain, right? It's not a bargain. 10000 is still very expensive. Bitcoin's worth 1000 a year ago. 
So 10,000 is still 10 times what they were a year ago. Yeah, it's not 20,000, but it's still expensive. Don't get suckered into that trap like, you know, a, a jewelry store, you know, marks up a product. They have a gold, you know, uh, necklace in the, in their display case or whatever. And, it, you know, and it, and it was, you know, a thousand dollars. Now they say half off. It's five hundred dollars. It's still overpriced at five hundred dollars. They just they just they just put a high price on there so they can mark it off. In fact, whenever you go to a jewelry store, everything is on sale. I mean, there's never a piece of jewelry that's not on sale. Because they're trying to create the sense that you're getting a deal, that you're getting a value. Hey, look, this used to be $1,000. I could buy it for $500. Yet no one ever buys it for $1,000. It's overpriced at $500. But they try to create these false uh, comparisons. So that's what's going to be happening in these cryptocurrencies. If anybody's thinking about buying, oh, I'm getting a great deal. It's half off. I can buy a Bitcoin for just $10,000. A month ago, it was $20,000. Yet you're paying $10,000 for nothing. You're buying air. You know, I went over that uh, a couple of podcasts ago, that crazy article about how it's like buying Ford stock 100 years ago. You're not buying stock in anything. You know, there are people telling me, well, you're buying into the blockchain. You don't own any blockchain just because you own a Bitcoin. Look, when I buy a car, I don't own part of the roads. Just because my car can drive on the road, I don't have a piece of that road because I happen to buy a car. Any token can travel across a blockchain. Now, there are people that say, yeah, but the Bitcoin blockchain is, you know, is the Bitcoin blockchain. So you need a Bitcoin to be on that blockchain. Yes, so what? So I'll get on a different blockchain. They're all the same, right? All these different currencies have their own blockchains. What's so special about Bitcoins? It was first big deal, right? So all this, all this talk, this whole cult, we'll see how it survives uh, this decline. But, you know, this, this could be the top of the, uh, the cryptocurrency market. We could also be the top again of the stock market. I mean, the air could be coming out of both these bubbles at the same time. It's not as definitive in the stock market. A one day reversal where we only close down a little bit is not necessarily decisive, especially on a Tuesday. I mean, a lot of these reversals that happen on Tuesdays, you almost can toss them out. Reversal Tuesday is kind of like an expression. And so there's a lot of this action. I want to see what happens uh, later in the week. I want to see what happens tomorrow, the next day. Uh, but if we get some follow through to the downside, then maybe the high is in in the U.S. stock market. I still believe the U.S. stock market is going to finish the year down. It's going to be a negative year, and that's going to be very bad in October uh, when the midterm elections come in. I think it's going to be a, the weakest year yet for the dollar. I mean, the dollar was down last year, biggest decline in 14 years. It's going to be a bigger decline this year, I think. But the big story could be the breakout in gold, the breakout of other commodities. We're very, very close. I mean, nothing has actually been confirmed yet. But I can look at it in the way it's trading and every day. I mean, the dollar, I think the dollar has been down every day this year. Can't remember a year where the dollar started off this week. And again, nobody cares. Eventually, everybody's going to care. But by the time they do, it's going to be much too late.